My name is Ryan Young, and welcome to What Is That? A Naturalist in Canada. I'm a naturalist, and I'm in Canada. And we're going to be looking at all kinds of incredible creatures on this program. Creatures that you might even find in your own backyard, under your very own nose, or on the paths you walk in your local woods. No one has to go to Africa, Australia, or South America to find living things that are fascinating. And we can all be researchers in our own way, contributing to the library of knowledge about the natural history of Canada. I am not a scientist. In Canada, to be recognized as such, I would have to have one or more university degrees in a discipline within the sciences. I am, however, an amateur naturalist, which means I study natural history as a hobby. I'm wild about nature, and every creature I encounter, I ask myself, what is that? And once I answer that question, I immediately want to know more. What does the organism eat? How does it have sex? What kind of adaptations does it have to survive in its environment? This is a program that tries to answer these questions and illuminate the ecological wonders that abound right here in Canada. As the viewer, your only task now is to follow my sometimes overly enthusiastic <laughs> and occasionally schizophrenic travels into this wild and wonderful world. Today we're going to look at dragonflies and also reptiles and amphibians. Dragonflies are one of my favorite creatures. They are so amazing with their big eyes and their amazing flying abilities. Some people say that dragonflies have been on this planet for 250 million years. I'd say that qualifies as calling them old timers, old timer insects. They're part of the order Odonata, which includes damselflies and dragonflies. Members of this insect order are easily recognizable. They feature long abdomens and thick bodies, or what are also known as the thoraxes, and the thorax is what holds the muscles that control their long wings. They have three pairs of hairy legs, a mouth designed for chewing other insects, and big eyes. One of the main differences between dragonflies and their smaller cousins, the damselflies, are the eyes. A dragonfly's eyes join at the top of the head, while the large eyes on damselflies are separated and do not join at the top of the head. Another difference is how each holds its wings. Dragonflies hold their wings straight out, like the blades on a helicopter, while damselflies hold their wings together and over their backs, or occasionally slightly spread apart. Now as a naturalist, I like to think that I'm an expert on life. And I love the diversity of life, especially amongst dragonflies. There's over 350 species in eastern North America alone. Worldwide, there's 5,000 species of dragonflies that are known. So today we're going to concentrate on just about a dozen species. Okay, what do we have here? Aha, a green darner, one of our largest dragonflies. This is a flyer type dragonfly. Dragonflies can essentially be divided into two different types, flyers and perchers. As we can see here, this is a flyer type dragonfly. It is rarely seen perching and spends most of its time in the air. And if a type of flyer dragonfly does perch, they usually do so by hanging vertically. Here we have another type of flyer dragonfly, a common basket tail, which are known for perching low in vegetation as we see here. Emeralds, so called for their luminous emerald green eyes, are also flyers and are rarely seen perching. Here, an American emerald perches in the grass along a northern Ontario lakeshore and dazzles us with its jewel-like eyes. Percher dragonflies like this small calico pennant tend to perch as much or more than they fly. Here we see a male identified by his red and black body markings 
and the dark brown and red patches on his wings. The dark patches at the base of his wings may help him to absorb the heat faster from the sun and transfer it to the flight muscles where it is needed most. Percher dragonfly species use perches to hunt from, and many compete for the choicest spots, like this male blue dasher on the top of this dead mullein plant. The Latin name for this small blue and brown dragonfly species is Pachydiplax longa penis. Dragonflies actually have penises that scoop out other males' sperms in females before adding their own. Other percher type dragonflies will perch low, even on a stump or on the ground, like this gray and black chalk fronted corporal. The scientific name for the corporal is Libellula julia. A closely related cousin is this species, Libellula pucella, or otherwise known as the 12 spotted skimmer. Here, a female 12 spotted skimmer is busy soaking up the sun's rays. Another close cousin known to scientists as Libellula incesta is one of my favorite dragonflies, the slaty skimmer. Males of this species are entirely dark slate blue with big black eyes. The smaller dragonflies include the meadowhawks and the white faces. Here we see a male dot-tailed white face identified by its black body, white face, and the yellow dot on its tail. White faces generally perch on the ground. And now, introducing the red meadowhawks. This male dragonfly is probably Sympetrum obtrusum, or what is known as a white face meadowhawk. However, other meadowhawks can look almost identical. So scientists say that even a meadowhawk in the hand can be difficult enough to identify to species, let alone seeing one well in the field. Female meadowhawks, like this one, are just as hard. Often one just has to say that they've seen a female meadowhawk. Dragonflies are interesting insects. They have a three-part life cycle, which starts with the egg, then the larvae, or what is often called the nymph or naiad, then the adult. The adult, which is the dragonfly we're so familiar with. Right around here, we've got common whitetails and widow skimmers flying around. And we're going to look for some dragonfly naiads or nymphs. And these are the dragonfly, basically, adolescents. Before they become dragonfly adults, before they go through their metamorphosis, essentially, they are aquatic creatures. We're in southwestern Quebec. We're right here near the McDonald campus of McGill University. This is one of their research areas. And this pond, which is normally a big pond with beavers and ducks, but it's been such a hot summer and it's been quite dry that now the whole pond has turned into a pool of water, just a muddy pool of water. But I bet we can still find dragonfly nymphs. So please, come with me. Let's see what we got here. Aha! Here we go. Just a little guy. 
probably had the egg laid just this year. Incredible. A fierce predator. People ask me, what is that? It's a dragonfly nymph. What species? I don't know. This little larvae here, this dragonfly nymph, will exist like this anywhere from one month to five years, depending on which species it is. And when dragonflies are in the nymph stage, or the naiad stage, they are active hunters, just like when they are adults. And they use their sight, their sense of touch, and even their sense of vibration in the water to hunt. Some are active hunters and some are sit and wait. They hide underneath the mud and as soon as a little aquatic larvae comes by, usually fly larvae, they take their prey. This is all that is left at the end of a nymph cycle. It's empty exoskeleton. When the nymph cycle comes to its end, it climbs out from the water, usually up the stem of some aquatic plant, and there begins to swallow air until it splits its skin. Then continuing to swallow air, the dragonfly adult rises out of the nymph skin through the split in its back. The event is rarely seen because it often happens at night under the cover of darkness. The next morning, all that is left is the old exoskeleton still clinging to vegetation. After the nymph stage, the adult dragonfly only has a life that lasts about a month, except in a few species where it can last up to nine months. Being a dragonfly, then, is actually the organism's final and shortest stage of life. Now let's look at the physical features of dragonflies. When we look at the head of a dragonfly, like this slaty skimmer, it's hard to see anything else but eyes. These huge eyes are called compound eyes because they are composed of thousands of tiny eyes. Each tiny eye or facet receives information on one specific part of the scene and the brain brings all this information together to create a full image. It is believed that 80% of a dragonfly's brain is used to process this visual data. Some parts of the compound eye have more facets than others to allow for more visual information. One can tell how good a dragonfly's vision is in different directions by looking into its eye and observing the size of the largest dark spot. These darker spots are clearly visible on the compound eyes of this blue dasher. The larger the spot, the better the insect's vision in that direction. A dragonfly can almost see a full 360 degrees around its body, seeing in all directions except directly behind its head. A dragonfly's eyes can detect color, ultraviolet light, movement, and even the plane of the polarization of light. Being able to see ultraviolet light means that when a dragonfly looks up at the sky, it appears very bright and very clear and this way it can easily detect small moving prey traveling across it. These amazing eyes have earned dragonflies the distinction of being the champions of the insect world in terms of vision. But it has also been said that they are the best flyers this planet has ever produced. Able to hover, fly backwards, cruise at 50 kilometers an hour, and stop or start on a dime. The net-like pattern in the wings, as we see here on a blue dasher, is a complex system of veins that helps to strengthen the wings and allows them to be flapped at great speed without breaking. Although it is hard to believe these tiny veins actually carry blood, air ducts and nerves, even the membranous parts of the wings between the veins are alive.
Due to the structure of their flight muscles, dragonflies like this common green darner, slowed down here to one-tenth of the speed, can move each wing independently, sometimes completely out of sync with one another. When a dragonfly is in flight, the forelegs are folded up behind the head while the other two pairs are held parallel with the body. When a dragonfly is about to land, as we see here, the three pairs of legs are extended down as if they were a landing gear on a plane. They are also adept at taking off from almost any direction. We've looked at eyes, wings, and now let's look at another interesting physical feature of dragonflies, their abdomens. When we see the abdomen pumping like this, it is actually a sign that the dragonfly is actively breathing. Dragonflies have tiny air sacs near their wings, legs and abdomen where air is sucked in and carbon dioxide is pushed out. These sacs are connected to tubes and in order to get the desired amount of oxygen an active dragonfly needs, it pumps its abdomen to flush air from one end of the body to the other. Finally, the legs. The legs of dragonflies have little spurs on them that help them grip things such as prey and vegetation. On the front pair of legs, which are normally folded behind the head, are a pair of flat bristles. These bristles are used to brush dust and water off the eyes. As this female skimmer dragonfly moves its head to clean its eyes, one can notice the tiny antennae. The tiny antennae of dragonflies indicate that they have a poor sense of smell, but the antennae may indeed function as air speed sensors as well. We've looked at some of the physical characteristics of dragonflies. Now let's look at some of their more common behaviors. Dragonflies are amazing predators, usually having a capture success rate of about 70%. This slaty skimmer is about to take off after a small winged insect, and I bet it has no problem in capturing it. Most prey for slaty skimmers are small insects like the one just caught here. However, often dragonflies hunt larger insects than themselves, such as butterflies and other species of dragonflies. Many people love dragonflies because they hunt mosquitoes and other biting insects, like the deer fly just caught here by this male slaty skimmer. Typically, when handling larger prey, a dragonfly will begin its meal by eating the victim's head, therefore rendering the prey harmless. This chalk-fronted corporal looks like he's enjoying his meal. Mmm, yum, 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 mmm, mmm, mmm. It may take a slaty skimmer a long time to consume an entire deer fly. This one seems to be concerned about the red mite. After eating, this chalk-fronted corporal is now cleaning itself.
Obviously, whatever dragonflies consume, some of it has to eventually come out the other end. They metabolize their food quite rapidly, and if you look carefully at the tip of this blue dasher's tail, you will see it come out the other end. Many species of dragonfly exhibit something called head cocking. Head cocking is essentially rapid head movements that are often induced by small moving visual targets. These head cocks, which vary in duration from anywhere from 40 to 1,000 milliseconds, usually occur many times per minute and in a minority of instances result in takeoff and pursuit. Some scientists believe that headcocks actually help the dragonfly aim itself and estimate where its desired target is. This is called the wheel position, and it is how dragonflies actually copulate. It is quite complicated and unique among insects. To get into this position, the male had to fly above the female and grasp her head and thorax with his legs, then curve his abdomen to grasp the back part of her head between his abdominal claspers, and then he had to release his legs and while attached, curl his abdomen underneath and place the sperm from a pore close to the tip of his tail into, get this, his accessory genitalia, which is found underneath his upper body. After that, he had to straighten his abdomen, and the female had then to bend her abdomen underneath his body and connect her reproductive opening into his accessory genitalia. Some dragonflies stay in this position for only three seconds. Talk about a quickie while others may do it for more than an hour. Strangely enough, the penis of a dragonfly is designed to scoop out or push to the side any sperm already present in a female. Often the injection of his own sperm only happens at the end of the process. Amongst many species of skimmer dragonflies, the male will hover above the female after mating while she's laying her eggs in the water and drive away any other male trying to mate with her. Other species of dragonflies and damselflies will lay their eggs in the stems of aquatic plants like we see here with these two damselflies. On hot days, many types of dragonflies raise their abdomens a behavior called obelisking. The warmer the temperature, the higher the abdomen is elevated, almost like a needle on a gauge. This allows the dragonfly to cool off a bit because it reduces the body surface exposed to the sun.
two white tails together. Yep, a common whitetail, Libellula lydia. There's a common whitetail right there, sunning himself on that log, that piece of wood right there, he just moved. One of the most amazing species we have here in the southwestern Quebec area. You can even use your binoculars to watch dragonflies. I do it all the time. Let's see if we can get closer. Libellula lydia, one of the common dragonflies we have here in southwestern Quebec. Common it may be, but amazing it is. According to researcher Sidney Dunkel, about 15% of North American dragonfly species are at a risk of extinction in the foreseeable future. As usual, habitat destruction will be the main culprit. The less diversity of aquatic habitats we have in Canada, the more dragonfly species will be negatively affected. Some of the more endangered dragonfly habitats include the pristine streams, sand bottom lakes, bogs and fens of North America. Pesticides also kill dragonfly larvae and sewage and organic waste from industry cause bacterial growth which then reduces the oxygen content of the water. Silt from eroding land caused by clear-cutting forests also changes the aquatic habitat of many species of dragonfly larvae so that they can no longer survive. Beautiful dragonfly habitats like this one need to be protected. Dragonflies are part of a larger web of life that is interdependent. They also share their habitats with other types of insects, other animals, including loons, ducks, red-winged blackbirds, and beavers. Beavers actually create habitat for certain dragonfly species when they dam up a stream or a river and turn it into a pond. Dragonflies also share their habitats with many species of reptiles and amphibians, which leads us to our next topic, reptiles like this snapping turtle. And amphibians like this green frog. Snapping turtles have to be one of our most prehistoric looking creatures. They are also one of our largest reptiles and can weigh up to 45 pounds. To learn more about other reptiles and other amphibians, I went and visited the Eco Museum in St. Anne de Bellevue. The Eco Museum is dedicated to educating the public about the diversity of life in the St. Lawrence Valley. There I spoke to the marvelous Fred Paquet, who is their curator of reptiles, amphibians and fish. Fred actually had a snapping turtle on hand to show me. So I'm going to show you a relatively small one, it's medium, okay. medium snapping turtle. That is 
insane. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to go. You don't want to go too close to his uh, to his beak right now. Uh, although he's pretty big and he's not moving very fast right now, they do have very very long necks, and uh, they can move relatively quickly. Like a neck out to there, eh? Uh, well, actually, he'd be probably able to bite my finger right now. Amazing. Yeah. They have very, very strong jaws. And they don't have a full plastron, right? No, actually their plastron is quite reduced since, they, uh, since they're pretty aggressive. Since they're pretty aggressive, they don't need uh, the shell for, for protection as much as the other species. Wow. That's amazing. And how old do you think this one is? Uh, this one is actually 10 years old. Wow. He's that big and he's only 10. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. I've heard that they can live a long time. Yeah, turtles are, out of all the animal groups, turtles are one of the ones that can live very, very old. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. He's yeah. got quite long nails. Uh, yeah, claws. Claws on the front uh, and on the back. The ones on the back for the females, it's very practical for digging. And the, uh, the, the, just whenever they need to go on land. So what kinds of things would this turtle eat? Anything that moves in front of it. I told Fred about another reptile I observed in Ontario's Pinery Provincial Park, the Eastern Hognose Snake. Unfortunately, it has become much more scarce in the last 10 years in southern Canada. However, a healthy population still exists in the protected habitat of Pinery Provincial Park. The eastern hognose snake is a specialized feeder on toads. Like all snakes, it smells with its tongue. This hognose snake can smell the scent of a nearby American toad. This toad is probably quite unwary because few predators can tolerate the toxins secreted by the two bumpy glands just behind its eyes. Continuing to smell the air with its tongue, the hognose snake gets closer to its desired prey. Trying at first to use its weight to control the toad, eventually it strikes and gets its mouth around the toad. Here we can see predator and prey using different adaptations. The toad immediately blows itself up so it is hard for the snake to swallow. However, the hognose snake has two enlarged teeth at the back of its mouth and it uses these to puncture the toad and deflate it. As well, through these fresh puncture wounds, it now injects a stringy saliva whose neurotoxins will make the toad too limp to continue struggling. So one might ask, how does the hognose snake deal with the toad's heart-suppressing toxins? Well, to offset the toxic effect and maintain its proper heart rate, the hognose snake has developed huge adrenal glands with a weight ten times heavier in proportion to their bodies than the adrenals of other snakes, and these serve to stabilize its heart rate.
the gray tree frog. This is a species that spends most of its time high up in the canopy of forests. Wherever the gray tree frog may land, it will often change its color to best resemble its new setting, thus concealing itself from would-be predators. Often in a short period of time, by expanding or contracting three different layers of pigment cells beneath their transparent skin, gray tree frogs can change their color from bright green to brown to varying shades of gray, whatever suits their surroundings. This gray tree frog changed from this color to this color in about 20 minutes. Obviously the darker shades of gray and brown help conceal it. When these frogs climb or jump, one often notices bright yellow markings between their arms and legs. When fleeing a predator, these suddenly flash into view, and it is thought that this causes the predator to startle, giving the frog enough time to make a safe getaway. Because gray tree frogs spend most of their time in the trees, we rarely see them. These are wood frogs, and here we see that there are at least five different males trying to mate with one female. Research has indicated that in frogs and toads that normally breed in ponds and lakes, there is an enormous imbalance of the sexes with often 20 to 30 times as many males as females. Obviously, we can see here that this causes quite a lot of competition for mates. The croaking type sounds are those of the male wood frogs, while the other peeping sounds are those of the spring peeper, another species of frog that breeds in ponds and lakes. These frogs were filmed in early April, and it's actually wood frogs and spring peepers that are the first frogs to breed every year. Eventually, one male and the female broke off from this frenzied confusion and were able to mate. I'm Ryan Young and you've been watching What Is That? A Naturalist in Canada. I'm a naturalist and I'm in Canada. Thanks for watching.